Okay, so welcome everybody and uh, welcome to, welcome to a, another table talk. Uh, for those of you that haven't uh, tuned in before, th these are discussions um, between a number of different people on uh, engaged topics. Uh, today, we're actually starting uh, a new series. Uh, it's, it's going to be in four parts. And this series is entitled, Why Am I a Christian? Uh, it's probably true to say that um, today, uh, in the time that we live, our faith is challenged probably more than any other time in history from, from different directions. Uh, and I think it's important that we can uh, defend our faith and that we know why we believe what we believe. Um, it's very good to quote some scripture on this, which is, which is highly relevant. First um, Peter 3.15 uh, reminds us that we should always be ready to give a defence to everyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So, so we're encouraged to know what we believe and why we believe it and to be able to explain it to others. And we should do that obviously with um, respect. Uh, it says with meekness and fear. So over the coming four weeks, we're going to look at a number of different subjects um, or questions, concepts that uh, I guess challenge our faith or maybe appear to challenge our faith on the surface um, that we would meet in the street in our workplaces, with our neighbours, etc. Um, the first of these we're going to look at today uh, is called an ancient earth, chance or design. So that's the first week one today, topic one. Um, following that, we're going to look at, um, I guess, a general topic of science versus religion. These two things are often put up in um, conflict or controversy with each other. You either have to pick one or the other. Um, but the question is going to be, can they coexist? Uh, the third topic in the series is called In the Beginning. It's going to deal with origins and uh, identity. And then the last topic we're going to cover um, over these four weeks is called Humanity in Question. What is the meaning of life? So these are all very big questions. Um, it's going to be hard to do them, uh, do them justice in the time that we have, but hopefully there's going to be enough to get people thinking, um, to get them um, exploring a little bit more. And to do that, um, we're going to engage with um, uh, some experts that we have. Uh, there'll be different people each week, and they've got a range of different backgrounds relevant to the topic that we're discussing. We'll be having doctors, we'll be having um, scientists like today, biologists, engineers, all sorts of, all sorts of people who can sort of share their um, knowledge, their experience uh, on, on these topics. So as I was saying, uh, we're, we're actually uh, under, under many forms of attack and it's always seeming that it's God slash faith on the one hand or science reason on the other. Um, but is that, is that really the whole picture? I mean, if the Bible is true as we believe it is true and God is the creator, then what he says in his word should match what we see in the world around us in, in his creation. I mean, shouldn't there be a consistency there? Um, and I think in these topics that we talk about, we're probably going to see that where there is a contradiction or an argument, um, that we need to understand uh, underneath of that our interpretations, our assumptions, the lens or the worldview that we bring. Um, is this colouring what we what we're doing? Because is it? I think it's possible, uh, and probably probably probable or true even that that properly understood um, God's word. And what we see in the world around us, when we properly understand these things, that they should actually perfectly align. So with that, we'll turn to um, the topic of today, which is an ancient earth. And to shed light on this, I'm joined by, um, by three people. So first of all, I'm getting them to introduce themselves really quickly. We have Tim Standish, who's an environmental biologist. We have Sven Ostring, who's an electrical engineer. And we have Kendall Miles, who's a biologist and uh, pathologist. So maybe really quickly, guys, if I could just swing around, starting with you, Tim. Uh, if you just quickly uh, introduce yourself, and then we'll get into the uh, in, into the questions on this topic. Well, I'm Tim Standish. I was born probably about three miles from where you are right now, I believe, in a hospital called St. Luke's there in, in Sydney. And uh, I now live in Southern California in the United States. I work on the campus of uh, Loma Linda University. Uh, for the Geoscience Research Institute. 
Thanks, Tim. And Sven? Yeah, so I'm um, Sven, uh, Sven Erstring, and I, I live in Newcastle, uh, just kind of up the road from uh, Sydney, a couple of hours, as, as you would know. And yeah, so my, um, I actually grew up in, in Hong Kong uh, and uh, was raised in a, in a medical family there, uh, but headed into to engineering. Uh, and um, while I was doing engineering, I just had um, this, this amazing experience of wanting to, to follow a pathway into ministry. Uh, so from that um, engineering, shall I say, applied science background, headed into to theology and ministry and have just been really loving the interface between science and faith as well. Great to have you along, Sven. And Kendall? Yeah, uh, very similar, I think, to, to what Sven said. Um, kind of grew up around hospitals and uh, the medical profession. Both my parents are nurses. Uh, I currently live in Sydney. I grew up in New Zealand. And my uh, current work is in medical science. So. Um, the first half of my career has basically been um, scientific analysis, looking at uh, blood samples and, and testing different chemical levels in that. And uh, currently I work in the organ and tissue donation service, uh, which is working with, um, as the name suggests, um, donation for the possibility of transplant into patients. So uh, that's, that's where I'm coming from at the moment and definitely the uh, intersection between science and, and religion and faith, I think, is uh, endlessly fascinating. Yeah, well, it would be great to um, pick all of your brains over this topic. I'm sure that we can all learn a lot. So I think this topic is very important um, because it sort of strikes at the foundation, really, um, of the Bible. I think it's probably true to say that up until the 1800s, most people took um, most the Christian world um, generally believed in a young earth. Um, people had done the calculations based on the genealogies uh, and we can calculate back to Adam about 6,000 years ago. And I guess that was the, the general belief. And then that was really kind of um, attacked, undermined with the um, formation of um, Darwin's theory of evolution. And then things like carbon dating and dating of um, dating of fossils and all these sorts of things, which pointed to um, an earth that was a lot older than the Bible would have um, seemed to indicate. So um, a, a very famous American paleontologist, Stephen Jay Gould, um, wrote this statement. He said, the most important discovery that has been made by geologists is that the earth is ancient, billions of years old, rather than thousands. The discovery is fundamental to our understanding of our place in the time scale of nature and also provides temporal context for the operational scale of geological and evolutionary processes on earth. Um, so, so this sort of is kind of very much against the, um, the claims of the Bible. It really is, a, I guess, a, a, a direct um, contradiction there when it says billions of years rather than thousands of years old. Um, it talks about the fact that we fit into a time scale um, and we're right at the end of that time scale. Uh, we weren't there at the beginning, as, as the Bible claims, um, and really makes us, I guess, less significant. Well, that's, that's how it sounds to me. So maybe in terms of um, kicking this off, Tim, if we could, if we could start with you, perhaps. Um, what is paleontology? I can hardly say the word properly. I'm sure I mispronounce it every single time. But what is it? And um, what is it that it's, that, that, what, what gives it its power um, to, 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 according to Stephen Gould, that the earth is four, four and a half, whatever it is, billion years old versus, um, versus you know, thousands of years old, according to scripture? Yeah, well, paleontology is the study of uh, fossils and uh, people who do it are called paleontologists. It's really not the fossils themselves that give some kind of indication of extreme age. Usually the age that is uh, proposed for fossils is inferred from something else. But actually here in a minute, I wanna draw your attention to something that uh, actually does give us a direct um, 
uh, at least hint at how old fossils themselves might be. Uh, the, the, probably the primary way of directly measuring the age of something that is now dead is carbon-14 dating. Um, when, but that only goes back uh, maybe to 100,000 years. So before that, you're dealing with other kinds of radiometric dating. But I actually bought some show and tell with me so that you could see uh, what it is that, uh, that paleontologists study. Uh, this is a fossil here, it's a trilobite. And um, uh, I, I have a bunch of other things I, I wanna show them all too because they're all interesting and actually quite beautiful as well. Uh, this particular trilobite, if you look at it, uh, you can see it's a um, you know, reasonably complicated or complex organism. It um, uh, has these amazing eyes. I don't, can you see them there? Yeah. Um, these eyes that are a compound eye, much like the eye that we see on modern insects and, and other uh, similar creatures. The interesting thing about these is they show up really at the first place in the geologic record where you start seeing lots of fossils in something called the Cambrian explosion. Let's, let's just sort of step back a little bit. And I don't know if I can share my screen, but I'm going to give that a try. And... Uh, Let's see here, I'll, I'll share this slide uh, that I have that, um, yeah, there you go. I actually hit that a little bit too quickly and now I, I'm not sure I can control it. Oh, there we go, I'm controlling things, I hope there. Um, so what I'm gonna sort of run through with you is a conventional history of the earth. So we start off with the big bang, let's say 13 billion years ago, plus or minus a few. And about 4.5 billion years ago, we have the formation of the earth. Before that, there's nothing. Then the earth forms. And, uh, and then once the Earth is formed, there is this long, long period that's sort of generically referred to as Precambrian. There are some other names to it. Most of that doesn't have very many fossils in it. There are some. But once you get up to these layers of rock that are right near the top, we call them the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, that's where we start getting lots of fossils and people build most of their theories off of those if they are using data at all. Now, just going back to 4.5 billion years ago, by the way, just because I'm using these big numbers, I wanna stress, I don't necessarily believe them. Um, this is the conventional way in which things are explained. Um, when the earth forms, it's a very hot ball um, of material. It's so hot that the entire thing is molten. It doesn't ha even have a crust on the, on the surface of it. Probably there was no life until the crust itself formed. And then sometime before 3.5 billion years ago, we have the first fossil bacteria kinds of organisms showing up. And uh, then there's billions of years that pass and about 540 billion years ago, the Paleozoic starts. The first layer in the Paleozoic is called the Cambrian. That's why everything below it is called Precambrian. As I said, Precambrian, there are some fossils, not a huge number of them. We start to see things like the eukaryotic fossils. These are organisms that are made out of the same kinds of cells that you and I are made out of. And... Uh, there are, there's lots and lots of details that go into this. I want you to notice that the time between the formation of the crust and the appearance of the first fossils is when life is going to have to have come into being on the earth. And so it's not really billions of years. Everybody is in agreement. We're talking about hundreds of millions of years for something like that. That's what the fossils tell us, even if you believe all of these numbers. 
And I want to draw your attention to something very important that actually was fairly recently reported on in Australia. That is that um, there is fossil carbon that is showing up in zircon crystals in Australia that was, or gives every indication of being fixed by photosynthesis. So life was around doing this incredibly complex uh, biochemical thing that all life relies on. But look at it. These are dated to 4.1 billion years old. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, well, just a minute, there wasn't even a crust on the earth. How could it be that old? And that's really the point that I want you to see. If you look at some sources, you see them pushing the formation of the crust just a little bit later to try to accommodate this because it's not realistic otherwise, is it? And uh, so what we wind up with is this situation where the instant you have earth, or at least a crust, you have life. Because we have what appears to be fossil material indicating that. Fossils can tell us interesting, interesting stuff like that. And um, uh, so that is kind of, uh, kind of important as we look at fossils. We want to learn things from them. If I'm a Christian who believes that at least life has not been around for millions upon millions of years, I'm probably going to interpret these kinds of data in a different way than somebody who does believe these incredibly ancient ages, who needs them for evolution to actually occur. Of course, it appears that evolution, according to these data reported in the peer-reviewed literature, did its, let's call it, its, its biggest trick, the creation of life itself in negative time almost. Certainly zero or very close to zero in terms of what we call geologic time. And uh, so when we look at this geologic record, there are a number of um, important trends that can give us at least a perspective on things. And I'm just going to go through those and kind of wrap it up at that point because our time is short, but you need to be aware of these um, trends and, um, and they will help you make informed evaluations about um, what you think about fossils, what you think about the geologic column. So uh, first of all, as we go from the bottom to the top of the geologic column, the stuff at the bottom should be the oldest, the stuff at the top should be the most recent. Organisms, especially vertebrates like us and cows and things like that, those that are at the bottom look less like those organisms living today than those at the top. And if that was the only trend in the geologic column, you might be excused for thinking, oh, that looks like evolution. Uh, the problem is there are other trends there. Moving from the bottom to the top, the number of fossil species goes up. Lots of debate about what a real species is, whether these are biologically significant or not. But these organisms with small differences between them, they tend to proliferate in the geologic column. Moving from the bottom to the top, the number of fossil phyla, these are the big divisions in which we organize organisms. Um, uh, they go down and possibly the number of classes as well, if you're familiar with those in biology, which is kind of a surprising thing because in evolution over long periods of time, we should see a branching pattern in which we get more and more and more diversity, but the diversity appears early and in a very profound way. 
in the fossil record if you're just looking at the relative uh, positions of things. Uh, moving from the bottom to the top, at first there are no land dwelling organisms, then their number increases. And uh, uh, when major groups appear, they tend to be more profoundly diverse than their living descendants. This sort of opposite pattern to evolution. Organisms at the bottom appear uniformly complex from the bottom to the top. Remember that trilobite that I showed you? That's an uh, amazingly complex organism. Um, think about something like photosynthesis. Um, that really provides the earliest, or that's the biochemical process that is uh, that there is indications of at the very earliest point. Um, that is something that you could spend the rest of your life studying. In fact, probably the first hundred million years in heaven studying and not get a complete grip on. It is amazing. And that's what shows up, bingo, right there at the beginning. Intermediate forms, sometimes we call these missing links, especially intermediate forms between really different groups. Um, they're the exception rather than the rule. Every once in a while, somebody will come up with something and they'll be all excited about it and, uh, and be saying things like, oh, wow, you know, we are, um, we've got, uh, you know, proof here of, of evolution. And uh, the reality is we don't. Uh, those are very rare. Evolution predicts them everywhere. Darwin talked about it. Anybody who's come since him uh, has said that. There's one piece of evidence that I want to draw to your attention that does show up in fossils that is an indicator that they are not millions of years old, a very clear indicator. And that is the presence of soft tissues that show up in things like dinosaur bones, like uh, this bit of a dinosaur's rib here. Um, this is protein, other, other kinds of things that show up there. Uh, one of my colleagues and I, we've been uh, collecting uh, peer-reviewed papers on this for a while now. We've got over 400 of them, talking about different biological um, molecules. These things don't last for millions of years. That is really invoking a miracle. In fact, um, uh, this, this rock salt here that contains fossil bacteria. Uh, people have successfully revived these things. They're supposed to be over 200 million years old. And yet, you know, I think they're better explained as contamination, frankly. <laughs> uh, but that was the claim that was made. In fact, when I was doing my PhD, a guy named Harold Morowitz came into the lab, tried to poach me away from my <laughs> major professor to study these things. I kind of wish I'd done it now, but I'm and didn't seem to be ethical at the time. So the, the point is, uh, when you look at the fossil record, there are reasons to think about it as being quite an ancient thing, but there are also profound reasons to think of it as representing something far more recent, not billions, not millions, thousands of years old. My personal position on it as a biologist is uh, when, if I'm gonna to try to figure out how old something is, I'm gonna look at that thing. I'm not gonna, so I'm gonna look at the fossils themselves, the organisms themselves, and I'll let the geologists, you know, do their thing if they want, but I'm gonna believe the biology, the biochemistry, and the straight up chemistry. And in doing that, um, I, I don't say I've got proof that you know, the Bible is true, the earth is only thousands of years old. However, the evidence is certainly um, strong that life is not really um, an ancient phenomenon based on the fossils themselves. Okay, so it, so it sounds like um, there's a range of there's a range of evidences, and there, there there's there's a there's a degree of inconsistency between um, some of the things that we that we see. So it's not an open and shut case. 
It isn't an open and shut case. You know, it's very easy to make the case if you pick and choose your evidence. I, I will tell you that um, I do say something that um, has been known to upset people, especially by paleontologist friends. And that is, um, I have not seen a theory that really explains the formation of the geologic column. Those trends that, that we talked about, they, they're kind of almost contradictory. None of, no theory fits them all very well. And, um, uh, you know, you can speculate on why that is. Uh, my personal suspicion is that perhaps this is hinting that the majority of the fossil record was in fact not formed in a purely naturalistic way. So when we do science, we have a tendency to be invoking natural causes. We don't expect that somebody's messing with things from outside. In the Bible, we have the flood. I sure wish it gave a lot more details about it. Um, waving your arms and saying, yes, the flood did it all, obviously doesn't answer a lot of questions. But one of the things that is clear about the flood is God intervened there. It wasn't just a natural process. So we wouldn't necessarily expect that we'd have a uh, beautifully perfect naturalistic explanation of what we observe as a result of it. Yeah, so the, the, what we see today, we can't just extend the process that you see today in, indefinitely into the past. There, there's, there's, there's obviously explanations there that have got some kind of intervention like the flood that you mentioned. Yeah, in fact, it's very clear that the, um, uh, the fossil record tells us things were profoundly different in the past. Mm. Um, so explaining them in, strictly in terms of what we observe today is a little bit problematic. You have to use some wisdom and care in doing it. Okay. Thank you. So, so Kendall, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, other forms of dating. Um, radiometric dating, I mean, my understanding of that is very high level. I think you, you look at the, the, the K rates of um, a isotope of carbon, um, but what, what do these have to say about the age of the Earth? Sure, okay, well, um, uh, thank you, first of all, Tim. Um, it's uh, covered, covered a, a fair bit of ground that we, will help to sort of, I guess, tease out what I was hoping to speak about as well. Uh, so, so with the, uh, we'll use carbon as an example, but first of all, just in terms of how radiometric dating itself works, uh, the basic setup for that methodology is that you have um, atoms that, uh, you mentioned the word isotope, what you've got is uh, various different forms of the same element, uh, for example, carbon. Um, it's most often found in the form of carbon-12, uh, but in very small amounts, uh, it can also be found as carbon-14, which uh, basically just means in the nucleus of that atom, uh, there are two extra neutrons. So they're um, subatomic particles uh, with no specific charge to them. And they, um, at a predictable rate, uh, will uh, spontaneously decay uh, to become a proton, and that then makes the chemical property of that atom change from being carbon to being nitrogen. Um, and that's happening at a predictable rate, in, in uh, at least at, at present. And uh, we can then take substances that have carbon in them, specifically uh, things that lived before. So. Um, fossils are a good example, or coal, um, this nut, which I got in my, uh, picked at a friend's house last week, uh, there's a certain amount of carbon in that, and some of that carbon will be carbon-14, which is radioactive. Uh, the assumption that is made in um, using that as a method to uh, calculate a date of when that thing was alive uh, is that uh, while we're walking around and breathing in air, the atmosphere has a predict predictable level of carbon-14 in it uh, in very small amounts. And then at the point at which uh, an organism dies, uh, 
uh, it's no longer uh, having carbon 14 coming into into that system. Uh, so we would then want to, um, you know, uh, ensure that the way that we're doing the testing is going to adequately remove risk of contamination from, uh, you know, dust or carbon that was just in the room when you were doing the test. Uh, so we want to select things that are sufficiently closed um, samples. So um, here's a pretend diamond. It's actually just a piece of plastic, nice and shiny. But uh, take a diamond, for example. The theory would be that any carbon that is in there uh, is, is not able to be substituted with carbon out of the environment around it. Uh, so that would be a sufficiently closed system to say if we were to detect any uh, carbon-14 in that sample of diamond, that it was there at the point that it was formed. Uh, the current understanding with the geologic column is that diamonds would be exceptionally old because they're very deep down in the earth to, to have been uh, placed under the sufficient pressure and heat to create uh, the hardest uh, substance that we have on Earth. Uh, so if there were to be carbon-14 detected in that, uh, then that would be very unusual. It would be unexpected um, with the current um, general consensus on the age of, of that layer of rock. And uh, so uh, that's something that has been done and there has been detectable levels of carbon-14 found, very small amounts. Uh, but as uh, Tim mentioned before, uh, the detection limit in terms of theoretical age is around 100,000 years, whereas the um, established timeline uh, currently would place diamonds uh, more in the vicinity of hundreds of millions to even a billion years old. Uh, so that theoretically would have no detectable amount of, of carbon-14 in it. Um, Another example that I did want to uh, just use, I did mention before that I grew up in New Zealand. And uh, so one of the examples that uh, has been documented from New Zealand is that uh, volcanic activity, uh, some of the lava flows that were uh, historically witnessed by people living in New Zealand in, in the uh, middle of the 1900s, uh, between the 40s and the 70s, uh, were measured by a different type of radiometric dating, uh, potassium argon, and they gave uh, quite a wide span of potential ages for that lava that was there um, of between 250,000 to three and a half million years. Uh, however, there were people there that saw the lava actually come out of the volcano. So uh, that's a pretty wide discrepancy in what you would expect to see from the testing. Uh, so I guess really, uh, rather than getting into the detail of, of radiometric dating itself, um, I felt it, it better to uh, look at just a couple of examples where uh, it gives clear indication that maybe we don't have all the factors, we don't have all the understanding present to be able to use that as a reliable measure for um, determining the age of the earth. Uh, being that we are getting, you know, uh, quite variable answers in some tests and in other places we're um, seeing a substance that really uh, shouldn't be there if the earth is as old as is proposed by other methods. So can I just ask you, um, yeah. just to make sure I got that. So you're saying in New Zealand, um, in recent times, mm -hmm. uh, there's been lava flows, but using... Um, radioactive dating, I think you mentioned um, argon. Yeah, potassium. Uh, potassium argon. Uh, it's actually showing that it's, um, what was the age again? Like a, a huge discrepancy. Yeah, so it measured five different lava flows that were there. Some of them were in the 40s, uh, a few of them in the 50s and 70s. And uh, they gave a range of different ages, the youngest of which was in the vicinity of several hundred thousand years old and the oldest of which the uh, projected age was um, several million years old. Uh, however, that eruption had actually occurred um, less than 100 years ago. 
And so uh, it really highlights that. And one of the potential explanations that was given for why that might be is that it's uh, the material that was coming up out of the ground was much older and then being brought to the surface as, as a potential explanation for why the dates might be uh, older than what you'd expect. And really that highlights for me, and I, I think that's kind of the point I was hoping to make is that um, when we don't have a full understanding of what the test results actually mean, is that there's something missing in our data and there's something that we have to go back and look at and maybe revise our methodology or revise some of the assumptions we've made about whether that's a valid way of measuring uh, using that technique. So is that being questioned today? Because I mean, I don't hear that very often. Uh, I certainly haven't heard that example. Um, if you've got that larger discrepancy, which is many orders of magnitude, um, should we not be questioning the accuracy of a lot of these a lot of these things? You just don't hear that. You just hear dates given with um, um, I think high degrees of uh, confidence. Come back to to something that uh, Tim was mentioning uh, previously as well is that uh, there's other sort of inferences made uh, in the geologic column and um, certainly a lot of naturalistic. Um, let's say bias to the way in which we sort of collectively in the scientific community are looking at uh, these kind of numbers. And so it, it in some respects isn't convenient to really shed too much light on some things that are really problematic from a larger picture point of view. And I think that's maybe mm -hmm. why we don't hear it in the popular media quite as much. Yeah. So I wonder if I can just jump in and, 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 and uh, point out something, which is when, when we're talking about science, uh, we usually don't talk quite as loudly about the failures as we do about the successes. And um, with all methods, there will be failures. Um, but you don't read about them so much in textbooks or in the newspaper and things like that. They're the sort of thing that leave people wondering and trying to figure out what's going on. They're talked about in professional meetings, those sorts of things. But, you know, you're just not going to, to see these things generally agonized over, <laughs> that, that dirty laundry aired uh, all the time. But just, just to give you an idea, um, just in the last few months, the carbon-14 dating method has been recalibrated. Um, uh, in reality, when carbon-14 dating is done, while the theory looks really great, I, it's, you could almost argue that nobody believes it because what everybody goes off is not that theory about the rate at which carbon-14 converts to nitrogen-14. What, what they do is they build a standard curve using objects of, of known age. And yeah, I mean, they, they just recalibrated things and moved some historical events by decades as a result. Uh, so there's always this, this struggle that we have. Do you believe you know, the science, or do you believe a historical record? In the case that Kendall was talking about there with the potassium argon dating on those lava flows, we believe the historical record, people saw that. Uh, we don't believe the potassium argon dating method in those cases. And um, this is one of the reasons why my belief is that while I don't know precisely what's wrong with all, you know, radiometric dating methods, we can look at them and know that they are not as reliable as I believe all of us probably wish they could be, because all of us would love to have really nice, accurate measurements about these things. Mm. The mm. data are real. The interpretation can be quite confusing at times. Indeed, it sounds it, it sounds that way. So, Sven, maybe you can bring uh, you in here. Um, 
is there is there a possibility to um, perhaps bridge the apparent divide here? I mean, is it possible that the Earth could be very very old, but uh, but, but life could be um, substantially younger uh, in Genesis um, the early the early verses? There is it. Is there a possibility that there's a there's a time gap between um, I guess an initial creation of matter and a subsequent creation of of life or the structuring of that matter into order? Uh, what do you what do you make of this? Is this is this a, a possibility? It's a ver very good question, Saul. And I just want to kind of step back a bit and say that what we where we're heading with this question is really we're going to to the bible as a as a biblical record as a as an inspired word of god so so where tim and kendall have been uh, coming from is from general revelation from the the record that we see in nature and now we are moving to special revelation inspired revelation and uh, we are, we're asking the question what what does the bible really really teach and I think one of the things which which challenges me or um, makes me stop and think is that so often what we do is we take the observations and conclusions from the general revelation from from empirical observations and we see them as rock solid if i can put it that way and then we try and wrap the the bible around those conclusions and what both kendall and tim have been saying is that is not necessarily the case. That as we find more, it, some of the things start to not look as, as secure and certain as we did before. And so sometimes what, what can happen is we go, okay, we, we want the human um, uh, civilization, the human race to have been here for a long period of time. So we try and find gaps in the genealogies, genealogies in the Bible. Um, or uh, we, we, we look at the creation record and we try and find gaps in between the different eight, um, days. So, for example, John Lennox um, in his book, Seven Days to Divide the World, um, he believes in literal days of creation, but he, he separates them out by long gaps of time. And I guess as, as, even as, as Adventists, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we are also, we want to believe in the Bible, but we also want to believe in, in science and general revelation as well. And one of the, the key ways which has been um, attempt to, to reconcile these is to effectively find a gap, as you were saying, in Genesis 1 to 3, so, so that there was a creation of the universe and our planet prior to the start of the creation week. And I remember being in, a, in the living room of a, a good friend of mine, a teacher, um, a, a deputy principal, actually. And I said to him, well, how do you reconcile these? In particular, how do you reconcile there being light on the first day of creation and then the creation of the sun on the fourth day? And he said, well, you know, that's easy. And he painted a scenario. And effectively, it was this idea of a gap. And I guess at that time, I, I kind of shelved it i parked it i thought to myself well that's that seems to make sense um maybe we'll just leave it at that for the time being but more recently just a few years ago i had reason to say i better check this out again i better explore this for for myself to really see what the bible says because what we want to do is what we call exegesis which means that we go to the Bible and we find out what the Bible is actually saying. We don't do eisegesis, which is reading into the Bible things that are not there. And I honestly saw, I wanted to find what the Bible said. I was, I was willing, I was open to find. And indeed, I'm still open. And I'm sure there's, um, uh, there's different ways of looking at the Bible. But I want to share with you my, the journey and the discovery of what I found, because I think it's really, really amazing and really exciting. Um, so let me just share my screen with you and uh, share these slides with you. So I want to, um, this is a mini Bible study. Uh, we are, I'm actually going to be looking at this in more depth in uh, the sermon which follows. So if you, you want to know the details, it, it's there. But 
first of all, I wanted to explore the, the day one, the first day of creation. And the questions that we need to, to ask is this, what does the phrase, the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, 1 refer to? That's the first point. Um, where, what, what is the Bible referring to? And then secondly, when did day one of creation, the creation week start? These are really important questions, which I um, started off with. And heading into this, um, what we need to understand is a literary device called a merism. And a merism takes two polar extremes and to refer to the, the entirety of something. So for example, I could say that the lady, she searched high and low for her car keys from the cellar to the attic. Now those are merisms. They, they effectively, what they're saying is she searched everywhere in her house for her car keys, they were lost. Or I could say the lawyer worked day and night preparing for his legal defense. So he was just hard at work. And what scholars recognize is that the, the phrase, the heavens and the earth is a merism. It's a two extremes, what's below us and above us to talk about an entirety of something. But there's an important point here and we'll dive into this even more in the, the sermon message which follows. And this, that is this, that merisms don't necessarily mean the entirety of everything. So when I say she searched high and low for her car keys, I'm not saying that she searched the entire universe. Uh, the, um, that merism does not apply. The, 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 the reference doesn't apply. Or if I say the lawyer worked day and night, I'm not saying that he worked all for the way from eternity past to the eternity of future. It's the entirety for a, a, a part of that whole, which is really important. There's another merism when, in Genesis, which is very important. Uh, there's the merism and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And uh, scholars recognize that this is another merism in that first part of the, the, the Bible. But of course, that doesn't necessarily refer to eternity. It's not eternity past to eternity and future. All it's referring to is one 24 hour day period. That's what it's referring to the entire day. So when, when we look at the word, the phrase, I should say, the heavens and the earth, it does not necessarily refer to the entire universe. And this is a very important point, and we'll dive into it more in the message that follows it. It can be a subspace of the universe. The, the, the entire um, creation account in Genesis can be a subspace of the universe. Now, Professor, Professor Jacques Dukan refers it to the human cosmos, um, a smaller subspace of the universe. And Professor Naham Sana points out that the Hebrew, according to his reading, is that the Hebrew refers to the observable universe. Now, for those of you who understand your cosmology, the observable universe is not identical to the entire universe. We can only see a certain amount of the universe. So this is really important. So there are exegetical reasons, which I'll go into more depth, to hold that the merism, the heavens and the earth, includes planet Earth, sun, moon, uh, solar system as well, and possibly the Milky Way, galaxy too. And this is really, really incredible. So that's my first point. The second question is this, when does day one start in Genesis one? Now there's a pattern in Genesis. And the pattern is that you have, and God said, let there be at the, the top. And then at the bottom there is, and there was evening and there was morning, the nth day, the first day, the second day, so forth. So that would lead us to believe that the day one begins in Genesis one, verse three when God says, and let there be light. But this is very important, and I'll, I'll share this in a lot of detail. This assumption is not necessarily correct based on an exegetical analysis of um, Genesis, because I'll show you just um, carefully here. In Genesis 1, uh, verse 2 and 3, it says this, the heavens were without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw that the light was good. And then the text goes on to say, and God called the light day and he called the darkness night. And there was evening and morning the first day. Now, when you actually match those up logically in terms of from a literary sense, the description of the earth in the darkness in Genesis one verse two, 
um, can be aligned chi um, chiastically with the evening of the first day. It's a description of the earth during the first night of uh, the first day, which is incredible. So what this means is the Genesis 1, the whole chapter is describing the creation of the human cosmos in six literal days. And from this analysis, what I discovered is that Genesis 1 is saying that planet Earth is as young as life and the Sabbath itself as well. And what I want to say is this, we, we try and look for a gap. Um, we try and look for a gap in, in Genesis. And uh, we're looking for, you know, is it in the genealogies or is it in between the days or is it between verse 1 and 2? I want to say that the gap is not in the text itself. We don't find any um, evidence for this. In, find we, in fact, we see evidence for there not being a gap beyond the creation week. Where the gap is, it's between um, scientific knowledge and biblical knowledge, but that gap is closing, as Tim and Kendall um, shared. And I, I see it as a very exciting area. And I, I encourage all of us um, to, to continue to search, but also not, not to look for ways that we can just fit in science into the Genesis account, but rather say, let's study the, the Genesis record for itself. And if the Genesis record points to the fact that our planet is young, let's, let's hold on to that by faith and continue our search and our scientific um, exploration as well. It's been an exciting journey for me. Now that's that's very interesting, and I look forward to hearing more about it um, in your sermon. I've heard I've heard um, people sort of there's illusions um, that I've heard about in I think it's Job where um, it suggests perhaps the angels um, shouting for joy when God created the world, which would sort of fit with the model that you were describing. Um, where you know the angelic host was already existing, and then God created, I think you said the human cosmos or the observable universe around Earth, uh, that subset of space into which we're put. Um, but there was already a pre-existing greater universe into, a, into which that is inserted. Is that am I reading you right? That's absolutely right, um, Saul. What we see in in Job is that there were um, there were heavenly beings. Job calls them the sons of God. Um, but there were, were heavenly beings and potentially inhabitants of other worlds which were watching when the foundations of our earth was created. And um, scholars recognize that this phrase, the foundations of the earth, is pointing towards the, the creation of our planet itself. Not, not just the surface, not just the inhabitants, but the entire planet and, and we see this picture that our Earth not, was not the, the first um, the entity that was created, and science would agree with that in the broad uh, perspective, but was rather a creation to, much later than, than the great controversy, um, and, and that, in fact, it was part, we, we understand from, uh, from our prophetic um, gift that we have, that was part of the great controversy between Lucifer and Satan uh, himself. But you're absolutely right. And I'll, I'll bring this out in the, the sermon that, that we're going to follow this with. Well, that, that's interesting as well, because obviously in the garden, um, you know, God placed the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So evil already had arisen. Satan already perhaps had rebelled at that point. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, co that's correct. And, and in the, um, the book, sorry, in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, it actually makes the comment that God bore long with Satan, um, which indicates a significant amount of time. Now, I'm not going to put a, a number to that. I'm not going to put a, you know, millions of years or billions of years. Uh, what I am going to say is that there's a clear indication that the universe was in existence before God came down um, to create uh, this, this world. The, the challenge with the idea of the passive gap position, which is where there's a big gap in Genesis 1 verse 2, is it's really that, that God creates this planet and then just leaves it as an undeveloped uh, piece of cosmic real estate and, and then comes back and, and 
um, kind of models and shapes it. And it, it's certainly a possibility, but I, as I've shared, what I've discovered is, is that there's no good reason to believe in that from the Bible. And, and that's very, very important. And I, I, I guess I plead with myself and others, let's not shape the Bible just around geology to try and make it fit and, and also not to, um, to try and make ourselves kind of feel acceptable in the widest um, scientific community uh, where, where there's indications that we, you know, if we don't accept that the, the earth is 4.54 billion years old, then we don't have no scientific credibility. I think that's very unfortunate and, and quite unwise. Hmm. Yeah, we need, we need to have a balance. Um, look, oh, I'm just wondering, Tim or Kendall, did you have any, any comments before we, we, we wrap up? I wish we had more time. Yes. <laughs> but I, but I, I, I hope that this, yeah, I hope that this does inspire people to uh, continue talking about these things. There's one thing I've just been dying to say about Kendall's presentation, and yeah. that is there is measurable carbon-14 that's been found in quite a number of things. The one that interests me is coal. That's mm -hmm. biological material. What that tells us, you would think, is it's young. You know, it's not hundreds of millions of years old. And this is, this is coal that is supposed to be over 100 million years old. Um, just exciting stuff. Um, the interesting thing is, I actually knew the head of the uh, Carbon-14 lab here at U University of California, Riverside. And um, his response to that was, it must be contamination. What it illustrates to you is people operate with their own set of presuppositions. And we need to be very aware of our own presuppositions as um, uh, really Sven was just talking about. We don't need to abandon them, but we need to be aware of them. We also need to understand that everybody else has their, mm -hmm. um, these influences that are working on them. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, I think as I said at the start, I mean, if we, Ultimately, the word of God and the true understanding of the created order, those two things have to go together like, like this. Um, if, if it doesn't fit, it's because we've got um, misunderstood facts, assumptions, or, or a way of looking at something that is, uh, that's a little bit out of, out of skew. Um, exactly. Kendall, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Kendall. If Kendall had any closing comments, then I think we need to probably uh, close. Well, really? No, I, I would just reiterate both what what everybody's been saying so far that, you know, uh, in any field, uh, be it science or in theology, I think we, an attitude of having more to learn, I think is a really good place to start. Indeed. Okay. Well, we're right on three o'clock. Um, I'd encourage everybody to, um, to, to stay and listen to Sven's, um, uh, Sven's talk up next. And I'd remind you also um, at two o'clock next week, We'll have the next um, the next topic, which probably builds um, directly on what we've discussed today, and maybe a little bit more uh, in general uh, around science and religion. Are these are these two really at war, or is there is there compatibility there? Can they coexist? So thank you for your time, and uh, I hope that um, you take Tim's um, advice there and start to explore these things more. We need to make sure that we can explain why we believe what we believe. Uh, and why we can trust what God has told us. So thank everybody for, uh, for, for joining in and hope you stay for, uh, for Sven's next session. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tim and Kendall. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you.
sunshine and the rain. Look at the hills, look at the trees and mountains. Valley and flowing river, field and plain. Praise to Thee, O Lord, for all creation. Give us thankful hearts that we the spring, think of the warmth of summer, bringing the harvest before the winter's cold. Everything grows, everything has a season, till it is gathered to the Father's fold. Every good gift, all that we need and cherish, comes from the Lord in token of His love. We are His hands, steward of all His bounty.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to our online worship at Fountain in the City um, this afternoon. I uh, just want to welcome everyone that is joining with us um, this afternoon. Um, to our regular members, welcome. And to our visitors that are joining, um, we just want to, yeah, want to welcome you to our online service this afternoon. So before we start with our service, I just want to open with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we want to thank you so much for the Sabbath day that you've given to us, a beautiful Sabbath day, and that we can be here together and worship you together. And Lord, as we're about to start our online service this afternoon, Lord, we just want to also ask that you may be with us, Lord, you may be amongst our presence and also, Lord, uh, fill us and open our heart and fill us, Lord, with the Holy Spirit that may teach us about your word this afternoon. And um, through our online service experience this afternoon, Lord, that we may be drawn to you closer. Um, thank you so much, Lord. I just want to pray also for everyone that is taking part in the service this afternoon, that um, you also will be with each one of us. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're just going to go th through some announcement. Um, so this afternoon, our service will be taken by Sven Ostring. And um, the topic for this afternoon will be our miraculous planet Earth. So looking, really, really looking forward for that. And um, I hope all of you will uh, be blessed by this presentation also. Um, next, we, as we are still worshiping online um we are encouraging for some uh, for you guys if you are available to be able to meet up as a, uh, in a small group um in someone's house we encourage you to do that so we still have that kind of um interaction with one another not just um watching um by yourself at home but still have that little interaction with, with some of our um, church members also. So um, today we have a group that is meeting together. Um, so I'm going to invite um, them into here and just to say hello to everyone. So we have a mascot care group with us this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Hi, guys. Hello. 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 Happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I'll just get you guys to sort of introduce yourself. Um, hello, everyone. We are the Mascot Care Group. I would like to introduce this lovely lady on my uh, right. This is Andy. And um, this is Rathne. And this is Roma. And well, the answer from Mascot Care Group, Garrett. <laughs> and my beloved wife, Jandi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Really nice to have you guys here. Um, and um, I think that you are having a really, really good time together there. Um, so I just want to yeah. ask um, a maybe a few questions. Um, what, what um, some of blessings that you have this week? So maybe if one or two of you guys can sort of say something, um, share some a blessing that you have this week. Um, okay, so maybe I can start. So, um, so if you notice, like uh, the sundown is um, like about four fifty-three every day, and um, so I was transferred in this project, and um, our project we didn't know that I'm a Sabbath keeper, and um, so I know pre previous project they know that I'm a Sabbath keeper. So yesterday I was anxious to tell her because I'm just new in the project and they might say something. So, but I prayed and take courage and told her that um, I'm a Sabbath keeper mm -hmm. and this is my belief. And um, she was okay with it. And she said, okay, let's talk so that you can go ahead and uh, keep your Sabbath. So for me to be able to share Sabbath to someone mm -hmm. is a blessing, a great blessing. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, I can add um, one of, uh, it has been a tough time for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, despite of the uh, circumstances, um, uh, the care group, um, the massive care group, we, we connected to our um, friends in the Middle East via, yeah. via social media, via Zoom every uh, Friday right. night. So not only here in uh, um, Sydney uh, Interstate, uh, we have in Melbourne. So we connected to our friends in spe uh, specifically in Saudi Arabia. So yeah. uh, despite of the the um, situation, uh, God provide a uh, blessing to reconnect each other. Amen. 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 All right. I'm gonna ask one more question. Why did you decide to to do this worship together today? For the food. <laughs> We love to eat. We love to eat physically and, and, and spiritually. spiritually. Amen. Amen. All right. Um. So I hope you guys will enjoy your time, um, joining us also in our worship. So thank you, guys. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, also, we are live streaming um, at this time, and also um, every Sabbath we are also live streaming. So at 2 p.m. we have our um, table talk, and um, at 3 p.m. we have our worship service. So if you, um, the live streaming is happening at, at Facebook and also at, in YouTube. So in Facebook, it's at in Fountain in the City um, and page. And in in YouTube, it's at Fountain in the City TV. Um, we at two p.m. starting from today, we have been starting a new, exciting series. It's entitled entitled Why I Am I a Christian. So just then, and at two p.m., we have a really really inter interesting talk. And um, if you have missed that, um. I'm sure you will you 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 will have the chance to to later on to have a look at that um, table talk. And um, if you are um, interested, there we also will have this um, series still happening in the next um, three weeks. Uh, so next week um, we will have uh, the topic for next week for the Why Am I a Christian series will be entitled science and really science versus religion can they co in, coexist so that will be very very in interesting so if you um are interested please join in next week at 2 p.m from our facebook page or from our U youtube channel um next we also have um our sabbath school uh, closing sabbath um program at Hashtag happy at home is also still happening. So um, this is a, la a Zoom um, meeting that we have to close our Sabbath together. And also um, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We also still have our healthy at home. This is our um, online online exercise together um, that has that is led by the youth. Um, so if you are also um, willing wanting to come. Um, to join exercise in the morning, please um, join us. Um, we are also starting our the Live More project. Um, if you are interested, please join in um, to the program. Um, you can visit the website there as join on the slide, and um, please also put in the event ID um, to to sort of go to the specific. Um, to the same class that we will be joining. Next, our regular prayer meeting. We are still having this um, also at Zoom every Wednesday night at 8.15 p.m. Um, you can join in via Zoom, or if also if you don't have Zoom, you can also join in through phone. And if you have any prayer requests, you can also put down your request at the link um, below. Um, Care group is also happening every Friday um, evening. We have three care groups. We have mascot that is studying at 7 p.m. 
um, our mascot group that was just then before. And um, our uni also combined U NSW and UTS is also having one at 6.30, starting at 6.30 p.m. And our forage for Forest Lodge care group is also starting at 7 p.m. Uh, next, our Sabbath morning Bible study is also happening every Sabbath at 11 a.m. We have three classes. We have our discipleship class. We have our discovery class that is um, just sort of studying uh, a new topic on righteousness by faith. And we also have our Sabbath school quarterly class. So please also join in. Um, next is our, it's time also now to, for our tithe and offerings. Um, we are not able to collect this physically, but, um, you know, um, we're, we're not going to stop you guys to have this opportunity to return the blessings that God has given to all of us. So, um, if you can jump into the e-giving app or e-giving websites, um, you can also still have the opportunity to return your tithe and offering. And if you are not able to do so, um, there are also some other options um, listed there on the slides you, that you can um, you can try to have a look. Um, and that's it for all the announcement for today. I'm going to pass now to Isabella, Jackie, and Stan for our praise and worship. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome to Fancy in the City, and our first hymn today will be This Is My Father's Well. I'd like to invite you all to, if you are able to, please sing with us.
Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. So now it's time for our congregational prayer. So let's all bow our heads as we pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you, God, for giving us this time. This time that we can talk to you, Lord, um, and really invite you um, into um, our presence and in the blessings of this day, Lord. Um, it's so amazing to have that relationship with you where we can be called your friend, uh, where we can talk to you uh, like in a relationship like no other. And I just want to uh, thank you, Lord, in the light of um, what we are doing today. Um, thank you, God, for an amazing table talk um, that we had, Lord, on comparing um, all these different theories that we can see from science and um, what the Bible says. And thank you, God, for giving us minds that we can work through these, um, but only by your spirit. So thank you, God. I pray that that was a blessing uh, to everyone who was able to watch as it was for me. And thank you, God, for the panel that was there, the amazing um, knowledge and uh, wisdom that they brought to the table. I um, also want to pray for humility as well, Lord, as we continue to learn more and more about what the Bible says and how it compares to what um, popular um, norm can say sometimes, that we may have humility, Lord, have a desire to learn more and more, Lord. Um, and that we may have a desire to recognize, Lord, that the Bible, that your word is the standard by which science is actually following. Um, so thank you, God, that you have given us so much wisdom in that word. And um, yeah, you've blessed us with so much um, ability, um, even though it's, it's little compared to how much you know, Lord, that it's enough for us to have a relationship with you. It's for, enough for us to know the truth. Um, and I also want to um, pray for this upcoming series, Lord, as we go through these few weeks, that we may really be able to understand a lot more about why we believe what we believe. So thank you, God, for all the people who are um, running this ministry as well, for supporting it, and um, yeah, all the people listening on as well. May you draw the right people to it. Um, maybe these are some questions that we're struggling with, and may you be able to answer those questions for us. Um, also want to pray for hospitality, Lord, um, in terms of these trying times that we're living in. Um, you know, it's been difficult, as so we are um, opening, uh, closing down our restrictions. Lord, thank you, God, that people are able to meet together in their homes. Um, thank you, God, for the Mask Up Care Group showing that hospitality today, Lord. It's really a blessing to see that people congregate together to learn more about you. And I pray that that may spread, Lord, um, contagiously, that love may spread in each and every single one of our hearts, that we may be able to invite people into our homes um, to worship with you. Um, also want to pray for the tithes and offerings, Lord. Um, even though we're unable to physically participate in that process, um, you know our hearts, Lord, and may you encourage us to be um, giving and generous um, and knowing that we're returning to you what is rightfully yours. And through that, um, you will bless us in so many different ways that we can't even imagine. So thank you, God, for that. And also want to pray for the sermon, Lord. Thank you, God, for Swen, his um, journey that he's been on, his experience and knowledge, and the way that you're using him to share this amazing message with us, Lord. And help us to be in the right mindset, Lord. Have, have an um, inquirer's mindset, looking to um, see how these thoughts fit in with our own understanding and the understanding of the Bible and be blessed by what we're about to hear. So please be with him as he shares his message. And um, yeah, may you speak through him, Lord. Um, this is so many, so important messages for us to know in these times, Lord, um, as Bible can be challenged and, and we need to be prepared, Lord, prepared to know how to understand your word and how to talk about it with other people. So thank you, God, for giving us all these resources that we can learn those things and giving us so many amazing people that we can um, fellowship together and learn. So thank you again for this time. Please be with us as we uh, continue learning more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. So now I'm going to in introduce um, to everyone our speaker for today, um, Sven Ostring. Hi, Sven. It's good to be here with you, Stanley. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Thank you for being with us, um, sparing spent sparing your time to speak to us um, this afternoon. Um, just want just want to ask a question so that everyone can. Um, sort of know you better. So what what is it that you do for now? Okay, so so I'm the what they call a director of church planting um, up in up in Newcastle. And so I support new uh, churches, new communities of faith. And if you go back in in Fountain's uh, history, shall I say, uh, the journey, uh, at one time, uh, there was a, a number of leaders who decided that they wanted to see uh, Fountain established as a new church. 
and then not only in, in the city at um, Haymarket, uh, but also at Maroubra as well. And uh, so my, my role is to encourage and inspire and train and equip uh, teams like the team that, that started Fountain and also the team that's continuing to lead Fountain as well. So that's my role. Oh, oh that's, yeah, that's really good. And um, yeah, I hope that everything is um, going well over there. And um, we, we're all praying that, you know, there's more, more and more churches planted um, in Australia. Mm. All right. Um, maybe if you can sort of briefly summarize what you will be talking about um, this afternoon in one or two sentences, what would you say? Okay, so in the, the table talk, I introduced the idea of, of what the Bible says about the age of our planet. And so I gave a, it's a fairly quick summary, quick overview. And I, I promised uh, that I would go deeper. So I'm going to keep my promise. And uh, that's what my talk is going to be. So we're going to look at science, um, or at least what some of science has said but then dive into a Bible study. So it's a, it's a deep Bible study, and I hope you, you're blessed by it. Oh, I'm sure we'll be looking forward for, for your message uh, this afternoon. So but before, before we give it to you, so we're going to have a special item first before that.
Well, it's really, really good to, to be here uh, with you today and um, really looking forward to our time together. You know, I, I um, used to live in Sydney, for those of you who uh, remember uh, when I was in, in Sydney, it was not too long ago, uh, but I uh, have a lot of good memories of being able to drive down to Key Street and to also uh, to go to uh, the, the lecture theatre where Fountain of the City was, or, or used to be until the, the COVID-19 restrictions came in. And so I look forward to being able to join you uh, there as, as well. And so what I want to do today is I want to take you on a journey um, through the Bible with me as we can kind of continue what we were talking about in Table Talk uh, itself. Now, it's, um, I, I just uh, want to promise you that we are going to dive deep. So a bit like a, uh, a submarine kind of trip, we're going to dive into uh, the, the Bible. Uh, but I encourage you to dive with me uh, because there's a powerful message which uh, comes out there as, as well. So join with me as, as I share this, um, uh, this message. And, and before we start, I just invite you to, to bow your heads in prayer as well. Father in heaven, I want to thank you uh, for this time that we can share together. I want to thank you that Fountain in the City um, is able to, to meet together and worship you. Father, we, we long to know what your word says. And Father, whether we are committed Christians and we want to know what you're telling us through the Bible, or perhaps we are searching and we're just curious, we really want to know what the Bible is teaching as well. And Father, I just want to pray that you would fill us wherever we are in Sydney, um, maybe around Australia, around the world, that you may fill us with your Holy Spirit and that we may be able to, to experience your presence right where we are is my prayer. And we want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as I promised you, uh, this is going to be a deeper Bible study uh, for <clears throat> the topic, and it's our miraculous planet Earth. It's an amazing, amazing topic. Recently, or early in this year, my wife and I were <clears throat> looking at building a house. And uh, this, uh, this house is one of the uh, the houses that's built by McDonald Jones. Now, um, McDonald Jones, you think, do they, do they serve you burgers and fries with their houses? Well, no, they, uh, they don't necessarily. But this is a, a very, very nice house. And if we were to sign the contracts for this house, and um, over time, pro probably about one year, we would get a brand new house, sparkling. Everything, all of the, the taps, um, all of the uh, all of the things inside the house would be absolutely uh, brand new. It'd be amazing. And if you're looking to buy a house, one of the things you're you're looking at is how new is the house? How new is this uh, this building? Because of course, if you know it's fairly new, uh, then it's uh, worth a lot, and it things won't break down as easily. Now, I've got a friend down in Victoria, and um, and her st uh, strategy is to, uh, to buy older houses, maybe not as old as this one. Uh, this one is fairly run down. Uh, but her strategy is to buy an older house and renovate it. And of course, there's, um, that can be a great thing as well. You can get something heritage. Um, you can get something which is uh, really you know, a, a period kind of building. But of course, in that case, the, the thing is that the home in which uh, my friend would be moving into is much, much older. It's not a brand new house. And the question that arises from that is we're not only interested in our homes where we're living in Sydney or in the inner west or, or Haymarket or wherever it may be. There's, we have this curiosity, which is also about our planet as well, our home that we all call home. You know, um, how old is this planet? How old is it? It's a, it's a topic which has fascinated uh, people for, for centuries, I would say. And, you know, we, we want to know, uh, is, this, is this planet a, a fairly brand new, um, shall I say, a home for us? Or indeed, is it a old, much more like that kind of rundown home that we saw before? 
And if we go back in history, what we find is that there's some interesting things uh, which have been said about it. Uh, John Calvin, a great spiritual Christian reformer in 1536 said the duration of the world has not yet attained 6,000 years. Uh, so according to John Calvin, a great scholar and student of the Bible, um, he said this world at that time, 1536, is not yet 6,000 uh, years old. That was his position. And he was joined not only um, by other people, but also by Martin Luther, the great reformer who nailed 95 theses um, on the door of the cathedral at Wittenberg. And Martin Luther said, we know from Moses that the world was not in existence before 6,000 years ago. And so what he was saying, obviously, is if we go to the writings of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, what we'd find is that we would be able to calculate that the world is about 6,000 years. And, you know, not only Martin Luther and John Calvin, but also if we go to Shakespeare, I'm not sure if you knew uh, this, but Shakespeare in his play, As You Like It, uh, the Shakespeare said the poor world is almost 6,000 years old. You know, for him, 6,000 years uh, was, a, was a long time. It's a poor world. It's an old world, 6,000 years old. And he wrote in 1599. However, within about 200 years, things started to really change. And in particular, people started to, instead of going to the Bible, to find out how old the world was. People like Charles Lyell and others, other geologists said, why don't we look at the world itself? Why don't we go and do some digging, um, some geological digs and paleontological digs, and why don't we find out from the earth itself how old it is? And indeed, Charles Lyell said to, uh, to people, he said, my goal, and this is very interesting, my goal is to free the age of the world from Moses. We want to put Moses to one side. We don't want to, to, to read the Bible. We want to focus on the age of the earth scientifically. And so what you had is you had uh, this, this guy, Comte de Buffon, uh, in 1779. What he did is he calculated that if we had a ball, an iron ball, and we heated it up uh, to, to a really high temperature, and then we allowed it to cool, how long would that cooling process be? And so he worked out, he said it was um, approximately 75,000 years old, a, a significant jump, 10,000 years older than what Martin Luther and Shakespeare and um, Calvin, Jean Calvin, wrote. But it didn't stop there. So, so we're starting at 75,000 years. We go to Lord Calvin, the guy who... Uh, you'd know about the way of measuring uh, temperature, Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. Um, and Kelvin measured based on the idea that the surface of the wor world was molten, a bit like lava. He calculated that the time that the surface would cool would take somewhere between 20 to 100 million years. So now we've gone from 75,000 years all the way up to 220 to 100 million years. It's a big, big jump. And then we move on to the uh, 20th century, Claire Patterson. Claire Patterson was a scientist and he went to this uh, crater, um, th this canyon that was caused by an asteroid, a meteorite. And he, he thought to himself, why don't, we, why don't we measure the age of the meteorite or the, 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 the fragments that are still in that crater? And he calculated that using radiometric dating he calculated that the meteorite which struck the Earth um, at that place was 4.54 billion years. Uh, so we've gone from 75,000 to uh, 20 to a million years, all the way up to 4.54 billion years. And that is the uh, age which, which scientists and, and geologists would say that the Earth is and how old it is. Now, there's a little bit of a problem here, if you think about it logically. Um, the reason why Claire Patterson used the, the uh, crater is that 
the earth has, there's been a lot of mixing. There's all these sedimentary layers. It's very difficult to calculate uh, the age of the earth. Um, it's not, there's not the purity, if I could put it that way, uh, that we require. So he decided the meteorite was much easier um, because it was easier to date. But there's a problem. When we try and date our planet using a meteorite, there's a problem. So for example, let's say I um, came to you and I saw in your garage was a Model T Ford. And I said, wow, you've got a Model T Ford in your garage. That means your house is about 100 years old. There's a problem there because the, the car could be old, but the crater itself, the planet, could actually be much younger. There's a logical problem with this approach to dating. But, you know, that's where science is. The big question, though, is what does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach us about uh, the age of the earth? If we want to find out as, as Christians and as spiritual seekers, why don't we go back to the Bible and have a look there? Now, there's, there's two uh, common ways of looking at the age of the, the earth. And the first one, the position one, is what we call a young universe which is when in the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it's referring to the entire universe. So literally everything. So um, heaven and the angels, everything was created either during that creation week or after, um, because that was the very beginning of God's creation. So what that would mean is the day one of cre the creation week begins in Genesis 1 verse 1, and the heavens and earth refer to the entire universe. Now, that's the, the first uh, position. There's another position, which is this, which is that uh, what we call a passive gap. So that God created the universe in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, um, he created the heavens and the earth. But then, as I said um, earlier in our table talk, God left our planet Earth as undeveloped cosmic real estate. This, this block of real estate in the universe and he just didn't do anything with it. The grass was growing high, all sorts of things. Uh, the, it was a complete mess, if we could put it that way. And after possibly millions or billions of years, um, which is described in Genesis 1 verse 2, um, we see what the world was like without form and void. And then in Genesis 1 verse 3, God's decided, I'm coming down to this cosmic real estate and I'm going to make something of it. So let there be light. And we start um, creating this beautiful earth. So what you see here is that there's a gap between the creation of the earth, planet earth, and creation of life and light as well. So that is the second position. And I guess, as I mentioned in table talk, I wanted to find out for myself. I wanted to dive deeper into this question and find out what the Bible really said. And so first of all, we need to ask ourselves this. What do the heavens and the earth refer to? What, what is it referring to in uh, the, the text? And what we need to understand is this concept of a merism. So just kind of re re recapping, <clears throat> summarizing, um, revising, I <clears throat> could put it that way. A, a merism uses two polar extremes. So, um, so north and south, east and west. So to give you a good example that I used before, she searched high and low for her car keys, or he worked day and night on the project. And so scholars have identified that the phrase, the heavens and the earth is a merism. But this is a really important, once again, um, remembering what I said earlier, merisms do not necessarily refer to literally everything. Because in the text there, there was a, another merism and there was evening and there was morning. And that refers to a 24-hour day, not to all of time. So what this means is that the merism, the heavens and the earth, can refer to a subspace part of the universe, not necessarily the whole entire universe and all of God's creation. It can refer to the observable universe or the human cosmos. And so why would I say that? Why, why would... Why would we go down that track? Well, let's turn to the other end of the Bible and go to Revelation. In Revelation, John, uh, the disciple of Jesus, said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. You see that same phrase, the heaven and the earth. There was a new one and there was an old one. Now, what it's saying is that the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So if we say that heaven and earth, the heavens and the earth refers to literally everything, what it's saying here is that God destroys everything, including his heavenly home, the new Jerusalem, all of the angels and all of the human beings, and entirely creates it from scratch, which doesn't make sense because heaven still stays there. The sanctuary is still there. The new Jerusalem is still there. All of the angels, the, the, the righteous angels, all of the saved human beings. So what this means is it's pointing us toward the fact that the heavens and the earth are just part of God's creation. And indeed, what I would like to, to share with you is that the heavens and the earth refer to the planet Earth, the sun and the moon, the solar system, and even possibly the Milky Way galaxy. When we look out in the night sky, almost all of the stars that we see in the night sky are actually part of the Milky Way galaxy. So if we're looking at just our world, what our human cosmos is, then God could have created all of this miraculously. It's really amazing uh, to think about it. So that's, that's where the, um, the Bible actually brings us towards. Now, I want to go to that second question and dive deeper here as well. And the question is, when does day one of creation start? It's a very important question because, as you would remember, the difference between the young universe and the passive gap is that the young universe position held that day one begins in Genesis 1-1, whereas the passive gap believes it, it occurs in Genesis 1 verse 3. So let's have a look at it, this. As we go through the, um, the days of creation in the text in Genesis, we find that there's a pattern which you can see on the screen. And every day, um, it's, there's a, it starts off and God said, there, let there be an expanse, waters, lights, um, fish, and, um, and animals. And then at the end of the day, it says, and there was evening and there was morning, the second day, and so forth and so on. We see a very, very clear pattern there. And so for those of you who like patterns, you'll immediately go, aha, that is the pattern not only for days two to six, it's also the pattern for day one as well. And well, you know, behold, you have that there too. And it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. So immediately you're thinking to yourself, well, there it is. The first day only starts in Genesis 1 verse 3. Let there be light. That's when it starts. But let's not jump too quickly to this conclusion. Let's d dig a little bit deeper into the text itself. And I want to bring it up. What you find is a number of unique and interesting facts. And that is this. On day three and day six of the creation week, there's actually two um, times when God says, and let there be uh, something. So on day three, it's God said, let the waters. And then God said, let the earth sp sprout vegetation. That's day three. And then on day six, it also says, and, let, and God said, let the earth bring forth. But it also says, and God said, let us make man in our image. Now, this is very important. Think about this. What this is telling us is that not every time when God says, and let there be, it doesn't always start a new day. That's the point. Because there's two on day three and day six. And also, if you look down at day seven, there is no record of a divine creative command. On day, sorry, on day seven, on day seven, there's no closure as well. Also, there's something slightly different as well. If you go to the first day of the week, you find it doesn't say there was evening and there was morning the first day. It was actually one day. It's a bit unique as well. And I want to, to share, point out that the, this pattern indicates something different. Something different is going on. I also want to ask you this question. When does your day begin? When does your day begin? Does your day begin when you start work? No, it doesn't begin when you start work because you might go to work at eight or 8.30 in the morning, 
but you've actually had a lot of things before that, which actually means that the day could have started before you started your work of, of design or creation, whatever it is. And so I would like to say that in actual fact, these let there be is not the start of the day, but when God started his creative work each day. Does that make sense? Very, very important difference. So these are, these are creative projects during the day, but not necessarily when each day started. And this is really well um, uh, founded, well confirmed in the seventh day. Why are there no um, statements and let there be on the seventh day of creation? There's a simple reason. And the reason is that God did not create anything. There was no creative projects on that day. So it points us to this idea that day one did not start um, at that point where God said, let there be light. In actual fact, there's a logical problem with that as well, um, because the biblical day actually starts in the evening. It starts with the night and darkness. So there's a problem if you say, let there be light, and you start a new day. Instead, what we see in the, the scriptures is this very neat pattern here where it describes the earth in darkness, where it says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, the face over the face of the waters, sorry. And um, then the next verse says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And then it says, and God called the light day, and he called the darkness night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. When you actually line these up uh, with the light and the darkness, you find that Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 is actually describing the earth during the night period of the first day. And this makes sense because if God says, and let there be light, that was when the day, the daylight started, not when the night started. This, this aligns really, really well. So what is the conclusion here? What we can say is that the phrase, and God said, let there be, signals a new divine creation project during a day, not the start of the day. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep, describes the night period of day one. And then also, when God said, let there be light, it initiates the day period, the dawn of, the, of day one um, in that particular day. So what we see here is Genesis 1 is describing, as I said, the night of day one is not a gap that extends back beyond the creation week. And we see this powerfully confirmed in Moses' other writings as well. So if we start to put, just lay these out, we have Genesis 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 3. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. At the end of that chapter says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And then it says in the seventh day, God finished his work that he'd done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work. But in Exodus 20, verse 11, it says it just parallels that amazingly. It says, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and then rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And then in Exodus 31, verse 17, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day rested and was refreshed. So you see that phrase, the heavens and the earth is tightly coupling all the way through uh, this, this, this chapter. So in summary, what we are saying here is Genesis 1 describes the creation of the human cosmos, the observable universe, the visible universe in six days. The heavens and the earth, it's the planet earth, the sun, moon, solar system and Milky Way galaxy. So that's where we arrive to. Now, the question is, is that confirmed in the Bible? Yes, it is. That the planet Earth is young. That our home is young. It's a new planet um, with reg regards to the billions and millions of, of years. So how do we find confirmation of this in the Bible itself? Let me take you to Job 38. Um, Saul actually pointed us towards this um, earlier in the afternoon. There, God says to Job, and were you there when I laid the, sorry, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. 
So God was laying the foundation of the earth, um, creating the planet, but there was morning stars and sons of God actually watching this process and singing and shouting for joy. Amazing. I wish, wish I could have been there. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, it says this, And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. So what it's saying is the planet Earth was created during that creation week, um, which we read in Genesis chapter 1. What I want to do is I want to take you to another source of inspired um, revelation for us as well. Within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of which Fountain in the City is part, we have a, a, a gift, a prophetic gift. And this gift actually gives us insight into this very question as well. In Patriarchs and Prophets, um, it says this, So long as all created beings acknowledged the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly host to fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting his glory and showing forth his praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and so unselfish. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies. So basically we see the universe in existence working perfectly. There was no discord or um, to mar the harmonies, no unselfishness, but something changes, something changes. And we read, it goes on to say, but a change came over this happy state. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted his creatures. Sin originated with him who next to Christ had been most honored of God and was highest in power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. In great mercy, according to his divine character, God bore long with Lucifer. This is amazing. What we see here is the universe was in existence. And uh, then the great controversy started. Jesus had not yet created the earth and its inhabitants. And it continues on. God's government included not only the inhabitants of heaven, but of all the worlds that he'd created. And Lucifer had concluded that if he could carry the angels of heaven with him in rebellion, he could also carry, could also carry the other worlds as well. Amazing. So what he's saying is Lucifer has this, this rebellious um, dream, this vision of, of just sweeping not only heaven, but the other worlds as well. Now, what do we mean by worlds here? We're talking about worlds being the planets with their inhabitants as well. What did Lucifer want to do? Lucifer wanted to, to bring doubt to the word of God. Did God really say that you can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He wanted us to, to doubt it, to change it, to, to twist the word of God. You know, um, it says in spiritual gifts, infidel geologists claim that the world is very much older than the biblical record, Bible record makes it. They reject the testimony of God's word because of those things which are to them evidences from the earth itself that it has existed tens of thousands, millions of years. And many who profess to believe the Bible are at a loss to account for wonderful things which are found in the earth <clears throat> with the view that creation week was only seven literal days and that the world is now only about 6,000 years. What it's saying is the geologists are, are looking at these evidences and claiming that the world is much older than the Bible record. And that word infidel geologist, it sounds kind of extreme, but what it's really saying is this. Um, infidel really means that one is no longer faithful to what God has revealed. No, one is no longer faithful. We've walked away from it. That, what's, that is what infidel uh, means. Also in, in uh, Fundamentals of Christian Education, it says this, God who made the heavens and the earth is the only true and living God the author of Christianity, the author of all truth, who instituted the seventh day Sabbath when the foundations of the world were laid, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted together for joy. So what it's saying is this, God created the foundations of the world. He created the planet when he created or instituted the Sabbath as well. Same event, same time 
uh, time frame as well. It's really, really amazing. So what we have here is inspired prophetic confirmation that this world is young. It's a, approximately about 6,000 years old. Now, I know you might be sitting here thinking to yourself, selves, what's the significance of this? So Sven's all very excited about it. It's, it's all very amazing. But, you know, what does it really mean to us? You know, studying at UTS or University of Sydney, working in Sydney, you know, you've got to get up early on Monday morning. Uh, you've got to work hard. Um, lots of Zoom meetings, for, for example, or um, Microsoft team meetings. Why does it matter how long the earth, um, how old the earth is, how long it's been around? Well, let me give you some reasons for this. First of all, uh, it's a very important thing that this untangles fossil evidence. So what we find is, and Tim Standish was pointing towards this, but fossil evidence is enmeshed with geological evidence. So we have this, this challenge. And so for the passive gap theory, if you believe that the earth is very old, then you've got fossils in it, which are very young, according to the Bible. And that is a real um, difficulty, a real challenge. And when we understand that the Bible, the biblical understanding is that our planet um, earth is also young, it completely resolves uh, this, this challenge. It, it completely removes it. It is absolutely, absolutely amazing. The second point is this is that in Psalms, Psalm 105, it says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Now, I want to ask you as, as Christians and also seekers as well, you know, if you knew that Jesus had turned water into fresh grape juice, that he'd calmed the storm on the, the, the Lake Galilee, if he'd fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, if he'd raised Lazarus from the dead, is this something to share? Yes, it definitely is. You know, we should be confident and bold about telling people about the miracles that Jesus has done. And if Jesus miraculously created our planet Earth recently too, then we should tell people about that as well. We shouldn't, we shouldn't try and look for, for naturalistic explanations. We should be confident and say, yes, the Bible teaches that this world is young because God created it uh, recently, about 6,000 years ago. And then finally, the other thing as well is if the Bible and spirit of prophecy, our prophetic gift, teach us that the planet Earth is young, then we should faithfully teach what God has revealed to us too. When Paul was writing to a young pastor um, called Timothy, um, he wrote this, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, rightly handling the word of truth, not, not chopping it up into little pieces, not inserting gaps or, or taking away um, uh, the truth that is there. We should present the word of truth exactly as Jesus has taught us. We should be careful. We should rightly handle the word of truth and present it exactly how Jesus has shared it with us. And my um, conclusion is this, is that when I study, when I have reflected uh, upon the biblical record, what I find is this, is that I see that the Bible is telling us that our planet home, Earth, is young about 6,000 years, that our sun, our moon, that the stars that we can see above us, all of these things are, are, were recently created. Now, heaven and the angels may have existed before that because of the great controversy, but our world, our human cosmos is young. And I want to invite you today, from now to through all eternity and every Sabbath, let's give Jesus the honour and praise for our young planet home. May God bless you as we consider this message um, today.
you so much, Sven, for the message. And um, it is a, yeah, it's really, really good that, um, you know, we can be confident in what um, the Bible is teaching and that, you know, the, 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 the message of a young um, earth can give us the confidence on, on, um, on the Bible and also on a, a good foundation on how can we be a good, um, you know, be good Christians also. Um, okay, um, just a few announcements before we, we close. Um, next week, um, we also have our service. Um, also live stream so at 2 p.m we will be continuing on our um, series on why am i christian um, and also at 3 p.m we have our normal worship service and that will be um, led by, by eva Inc. that's uh, she's the cfo of the greater sydney conference so we'll stay tuned also join us also next week um, in our live streaming. And talking about the series of Why Am I Christian next week, our, our topic will be on science versus religion. Can they coexist? So we will be joined by uh, three different panels. Uh, we will, we'll, Swen will be back with us again next week. And we will also have um, Dr. Daryl Cheng um, and also David Pennington. So um, stay tuned and please join us at 2 p.m. next week for this interesting topic. Next, um, we have our closing Sabbath um, program at 4.45 today. Um, that will be um, happening in a few minutes, in half an hour or so. And next, uh, and tomorrow we also have our again our healthy at home morning exercise so if you have um you want to join please join us um at the link shown there in the slide um just so as just to close can i ask sven to close in a word of prayer as we close our program this afternoon sure let's bow our heads as we pray together father in heaven i just want to thank you so much I want to thank you for, for the gift of your only son, Jesus, to come down to this world where there's so much pain and suffering, suffering that we have brought upon ourselves when we decided to, to walk away from you. But instead of just abandoning us, uh, you stepped into our world so that you give us uh, the choice of, of being saved, of having eternal life. And we just want to thank you so much for that. But we also want to thank you that you've given us the gift of the Bible, the inspired writings in the Bible, and also the, uh, the, the, gift, of the, the gift of spirit of prophecy as well for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Father, we want to thank you that when we read the Bible, we read of this miraculous creation of our planet Earth and all of the life in it, and even our sun and our moon and the stars that we can we can see in the night sky. And we can thank you that you created all of this in six literal days, fairly recently, only 6,000 years ago. And we can thank you because this means that the death and pain and suffering have not been occurring on this world for, for billions and millions of years, like, like many scientists uh, have, have come to, to believe in. But instead, you created a perfect world, a beautiful world. And that reminds us, the fact that you created a beautiful world about 6,000 years ago, fairly recently, reminds us that in the near future, the very near future, you can create a brand new heavens and the earth as well. That, that you can transform this, this world into a beautiful home for us again. And Father, I just want to pray for every single person listening uh, today, that they, they may be touched by your Holy Spirit, that, that your Holy Spirit would speak to them, that they may know that you're coming soon, that the same miracle that created this planet will also be, be once again um, accomplished in the very near future, and that we can actually be there if we choose to trust in you, Jesus. 
we can be there. We can, we can actually watch you create a new heavens and a new earth. And we just want to thank you so much for this. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit. May, may you speak powerfully to each one of our hearts. May we know that what is in the Bible is not just um, insignificant, inconsequential details, but everything that you've shared with us is profoundly significant for us, that we can trust you, that you have our best interest in mind, and that very, very soon, you're going to put it to an end to all of this injustice, the suffering and the pain, and we can live with you forever. And we thank you. We look forward to it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining our worship this afternoon. Um, I hope you have a blessed Sabbath day. And um, God bless you and see you next week.